evening, everyone, and welcome to the latest instalment of Border 100, brought to you by Louth County Council. Tonight's subject is the Church of Ireland, Irish Anglicans and Partition. And I'm joined by uh, three people who've literally wrote the book on aspects of the Church of Ireland and Ireland in the 20th century. It's Dr. Ian Dalton, Dr. Ida Milne, and Professor Brian Walker, all of whom I let introduce themselves, starting with Ian. Hello, um, it's good to be here, and uh, thank you, Tommy, for, for inviting me. Um, I'm a, I'm not a professional historian, never has been, have been, but I have a very passionate interest in Southern Irish Protestantism and uh, and its history. I'm a, currently a visiting research fellow in the in the Centre for Contemporary Irish History in Trinity, and with my uh, with the lady below, uh, we're we've we've co-edited a. Of a, a recent volume uh, published by Cork University Press in 2019, uh, which was entitled Protestant and Irish, uh, the Minority Search for Place in Independent Ireland. And that takes the story on from 1922. Um, and, but today we're talking about around that period. That's great. Ida, I think that kind of tees you up. Great. And thank you very much, uh, Tom, for inviting me on here. Um, I suppose my principal research field is uh, from a similar topic, from another topic in the same period, is from the Spanish flu. And um, indeed, I've done one of these talks in, in, in Louth in, in, in the past on the Spanish flu. Uh, but I found myself alongside my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Dalton, um, who actually indeed is far a, a great historian of, of, of the Church of Ireland and, and Protestantism in Ireland. Uh, I found myself kind of reversing into my Protestant background, my four or, you know, several hundred years worth of Protestant connections in the Southeast, because I could see there was a kind of myopia in, in history and that maybe the kind of people um, from which I came, uh, which are not the kind of people covered by documentary records, like farmers in Wexford are often not in the documentary records, apart from uh, dressing a sheep for the county show or something like that. Um, but that, 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 that they were absent from the records. My particular field of interest is actually Protestants in the GAA, which a lot of people said didn't exist, but it was very much a hidden history. And um, with Ian, as I said, we co-edited Protestant and Irish. And I find it's becoming a bigger and bigger part of my work now. So now I'll hand over, I suppose, to, to um, Professor Walker, our good friend. I, I thank you very much. Uh, I'm Brian Walker. I'm a historian, political scientist, graduate of Trinity. I'm Professor Emeritus of Irish Studies at Queen's. I have an interest in 19th and 20th century Irish political history. Uh, and as part of that, uh, I looked at a, an interesting aspect of Church of Ireland history in this period, which perhaps had been ignored. And that were the sins that were going on. Uh, the Church of Ireland is a church with sins every uh, year, diocese general. And I thought, let's trace these through this revolutionary period. What were people saying? What were they concerned about? Uh, so that's led me to write a number of articles on that subject. Uh, and I'm interested in the more general picture of how we remember this period. Now, within Church of Ireland circles, um, much of this period was put to one side. People preferred not to remember. Uh, but now people feel more at ease in recalling these events. Uh, and they're very interesting. Uh, I may, if, if you don't mind, add end on a personal note. I have a relative, actually, a slightly distant relative who's involved in politics in this period in County Louth, and that's Richard Hazelton, who was the unsuccessful Irish Parliamentary Party candidate in 1918, uh, losing out very narrowly to a Sinn Féin candidate. Now, I have a cousin, uh, Professor Will Hazelton at Ohio University, a cousin to my mother's side, and he's a close relative uh, of the late uh, Richard Hazelton, uh, who after failing in County Louth, went, went to Britain, became a trade unionist and a very prominent trade unionist. Um, so I do have a local connection, but I'm very pleased to be here with my colleagues talking about this very interesting subject tonight. Over to you, Tommy. That's great. Thanks, everyone. Um, I suppose we can start by maybe Ian could give us a bit of a chat about how Anglicans and the church reacted to proposals for partition going going back, you know, as early as you like, really, and, you know, as early or as early as you feel is important. 
Yeah, it, it, um, I, I think um, partition didn't obviously just come out of the blue. It, it didn't suddenly explode on on the scene in in uh, in nineteen uh, in nineteen nineteen or nineteen twenty. Um, th there's there's evidence of what you would call clear evidence of a partitionist mentality. Uh, I mean, it goes back to the uh, uh, politically to the, to the first Home Rule Bill uh, in, in, in 1885, 86. But even before then, you, you are all, one is conscious of a religious and theological divide within the Church of Ireland um, at the time. Broadly speaking, it's a dangerous generalization, but, but, but to some extent it holds true. Uh, Northern Anglicans tended to be more evangelical, more biblically literal, um, uh, more, shall we say, firm in their opinions. Um, Southern Anglicans had, I think, a more blurred and softer edge to them. Now, you, you, you can't totally generalize about that, but broadly speaking, there was that sense of, 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 of difference, of a divide. Um, it comes out in the... <clears throat> To some extent, in the debates in 18, between 1869 and 1871, on the uh, on, church, on the Church of Ireland disestablishment, uh, when the uh, when you have attempts to revise the prayer book after disestablishment in 1878, you find again that there are uh, divisions which broadly correspond to North and South, and of course, by the same token, the North Northern Protestantism. In this period, in the later period of the 19th century, early 20th, is already beginning to make itself felt as something different from the rest of Ireland. Um, Southern Unionists, stroke Protestants, stroke Anglicans, however you want to uh, define them, um, as it were, went along on the coat trails of Northern uh, opposition to Home Rule on the basis that it would stymie home rule for, for the entire Ireland. But as it turned out, it was a rather bad investment. The, the bet effectively didn't pay off because Northern Unionism was always going to go more or less from the early 20th century, was almost going to head off on its own particular course. So you have, you have that sort of uh, background. The other area where it, uh, it, the, the formation of the Ulster Unionist Council, for instance, in 1904, 1905, is a very clear indication of Northern exceptionalism and difference from the rest of what you might call Irish loyalism, Irish Protestantism. And in the, in the Irish convention between 1917 and 1918, it becomes very obvious there that there is a Northern caucus that, that, that will not surrender, will not give an inch. Um, the Southern Anglican representatives in that uh, convention, um, principally Archbishop Bernard, uh, Lord Middleton, are, are already seeing the writings on the wall. And the church in the South is beginning to come to terms with the idea that there is going to be, um, that there is going, to, that home rule is going to happen in some form or another. Uh, Lord Barrymore, a, a leader, an Anglican and leader of the Unionists in 1913 in the House of Lords said more or less that it was inevitable and it was going, it, it was going to happen. But the Northerners were not going to give anything away. So therefore you have this sort of gradual, it, it, it's a stuttering divergence, if you like, in Irish Anglicanism politically. But that's the point. It is political. Uh, it is not necessarily religious, but we can deal with that later. Okay. I'd actually have a question, which um, either might take up, and we can go back to Ian if you have anything to add, is when we're talking about a division, and Brian as well, if we're talking about a division between the North and the South, where is the division? So I think this is something that came up when I was I was at the launch of yourself and Ida's book, or Ida and um, which was, you know, that there may be a a, a a cultural difference between, you know, the the border doesn't necessarily coincide with the political border. So Protestants in Monaghan and Donegal may in fact have more have a lot uh, culturally have a lot more in common with their fellows in Fermanagh than say. Um, their fellows in Wexford, Ida. Oh yeah, I mean that's something I suppose. Um, Ian and I and and Brian have had long discussions and often very heated discussions about you know where those divides are and what the tensions are and for example what the politics are, are, are of um, 
uh, different Protestant populations around the country are. And I think there is a kind of an assumption uh, made often, not by my two esteemed colleagues, but by other historians who mightn't be quite so learned in this field, that a lot of people who weren't political were, and that the term loyalist or unionist would apply to them. Whereas in fact, um, when I look at, um, you know, in recent years, there's been a lot of work done by oral historians, particularly on the Southeast. So people like Deirdre Nuttall's work or uh, Catherine O'Connor's work uh, on the Diocese of Ferns, um, will talk, even though we're talking, you know, their work is, you know, beyond a, a few years beyond partition, um, that um, there is no sense um, that the people we were surveying and that I would come from as a people are political. You know, they might be mildly political now in the sense of being Fidigale followers or something like that. Um, but that, um, you know, when I look through my family letters, my family um, history which goes back i have documentary history back to 1798 even in 1798 they weren't political you know they weren't on one side or other in 1798 and um but they were concerned about farming about economics about local economies about their livelihoods about their families about their parish but not about the bigger pictures now they would probably uh during the second war the first world war and the second world war have had a certain loyalty to the British rather than, you know, and certainly um, in the First World War, um, you know, we had family engaged in the First World War. But um, I think in the Southeast, we are quite a different population and that we're not political. And I think that that actually 1798 holds the key to that, that maybe we became determinedly non-political after that period. Okay, very interesting. Mm. And again, Ryan, sorry, that it would be quite diffi yes. difficult to, to urban populations or the north or the border. Yeah. Mm. Okay, well, Brian, just... And just to react to that mm. and maybe just tell us again, I mean, about yeah. maybe Northern yes. Anglicans' views of proposals for yeah. partition yeah. and so on. Well, can I just spell out what the, what the figures are? Uh, I mean, the Church of Ireland population in Ireland in 1911 uh, is about 570,000 people. And all of those 250,000 are in the 26 counties, uh, which leaves a, a, a larger number, about 320, uh, are in the north. So the church is stronger in the north, but nonetheless very strong in the south. Um, now, these people see themselves as Irish. Uh, they also see themselves, by and large, as unionist. Uh, in 1912, at the, the Synod, uh, there is a vote uh, which on the question of home rule. Uh, the Synod comes out, the General Synod representing all the Church of Ireland comes out uh, very, very strongly uh, against home rule. They declare against home rule with only a small number uh, deferring from that. Uh, and they're all against home rule. But they want Ireland as one at this stage. There's no talk really of partition at this stage, 1912. However, this does then enter the debate uh, and we now see divisions between northerners and southerners uh, with southerners not at all happy with this idea of partition and in 1917 there's a break in the rank of the bishops the church of Ireland bishops three of them side and write and sign up to a resolution passed by some 16 catholic bishops stating their opposition to home rule uh, opposition to partition uh, we see more evidence of this in the irish convention uh, so th there is this uh, difference within the church, uh, but things then proceed. Um, we then have uh, the 1918 general election with the War of Independence, uh, and we then have the Government of Ireland Act. And at that stage then we see uh, things settling down up to this date. The Church of Ireland Gazette, for example, has said uh, it it's against partition. It doesn't like the idea at all. It wants to take all of Ireland as one, but one uh, link to Britain. However, once a uh, partition then is announced, the Government of Ireland Act is announced, then the Gazette accepts this as a fact that we have to live with. Uh, and that's what happens then uh, within the church is an acceptance of these two new jurisdictions. But there's a strong conviction that the Church of Ireland must remain one church. And that was the conviction then and remains the conviction uh, within members of the Anglican Church in Ireland. That's that's interesting. So, Could I just ask you a, a general question, maybe? Do you, do you think that 
role um, whereby the church was determined to stay one church. Do you think that fed into any other areas of life or do you think it was just a reflection of a similar dynamic held by the same people? Just, uh, I mean, it's noticeable that, say, sports, which a lot of Church of Ireland yes. people would play, such as hockey, rugby and cricket, all stay united at this point as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, they do. They do. Uh, I mean, on the one hand, we acknowledge the divisions that happen, uh, the new divisions that happen, new political divisions, which affects various walks of life. But there are other aspects of life uh, where things continue. Uh, uh, and we see that in sport. Uh, we see it in other areas, uh, educational or cultural areas. Um, among many people in the north uh, uh, who see themselves as British citizens, it's strong to emphasize they still see themselves as Irish. Now, there's a bit of a, a rivalry here and a division of opinion with more wanting to emphasize the Ulster aspect, but there remains a significant number uh, who continue to see themselves as Irish. So you're right to say uh, that these uh, new divisions emerge with partition, uh, but there remains uh, unity in a number of other areas that are very important for people's lives. I think it's uh, I need some I, I entirely agree with what Brian has said and and your your question Tommy is, is is perfectly valid but there was there were some frissons of nervousness around part uh, political partition about the, the church and Archbishop Bernard uh, was particularly concerned uh, and expressed it to, to some other people that the, that the church itself might fissure and um, and I, I think if it had, it, it, if that had happened, it would have been probably because of pre-existing, the sort of pre-existing fault lines that, that I was talking about earlier. And uh, the fact that it didn't, I think, is a tribute to the leadership of churches, particularly expressed through the general synods, um, because they, they were the public statements of the position of the church gathered together with elected uh, members Remember, you know the, the synod consists of, of three houses the bishops the clergy and the laity the laity the laity are effectively the elected representatives of the parishes so it's a very powerful sort of voice that the church of ireland is able to 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 have um but of course we, we should remember that that none of the churches on the island uh, splintered or split as a result of of, of, of partition um, and in some ways, one, I suppose the curious thing about partition in general is, is not that, that things fractured, but that so many things didn't. You've mentioned sporting bodies, but there's a whole host of professional, um, professional organizations, so on and so forth, um, that actually stayed together as a physical unity. Uh, as as a, a legal and physical unity, and I, we 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 sometimes I think can overemphasize the the effect of partition on ordinary life in that regard. Um, a lot of things went on. Um, church uh, it, within the Church of Ireland, clerics went southern clerics went to northern parishes, northern clerics went to southern ones, and that that was what had always happened, and it continued. Life continued pretty much as it always was. Um, uh, the representative church body, which is the church's effectively governing body, um, had to wrestle with having to um, effectively operate now in two tax jurisdictions. Uh, so mammon was probably far more important in that regard than God, if I can put it that way. Okay, th thanks Ian. Just in, in respect, I know we're jumping ahead now to to. Re to so we'll probably jump back chronologically, but just in terms of the point Brian raised about identity, how important do you think the maintenance of some symbols of connection with Britain was to Anglicans around this time? Well, uh, I mean, many Anglicans still valued the link with Britain. And don't forget, after 1921, Ireland was not a republic. Ireland was part of the Commonwealth and remains so until 1949. Uh, and uh, people are entitled to you know, therefore acknowledge this link with Britain uh, and, and some and many did. Um, but obviously things are changing. Uh, 1949 would, would bring a great change in that. But in this earlier period, uh, 
uh, I think a, a lot of most of these people of the Church of Ireland background would have seen themselves as unionists, valuing that union. Um, and, and that is the way their, their politics were. Afterwards, however, as I say, uh, there are changes. Ireland is now the Irish Free State. Uh, there's a separate jurisdiction, uh, but Ireland remains part of the Commonwealth. Yeah, and I just wonder, Brian, is there a, a parallel here with Scotland? So um, I think some people in the South find it utterly incomprehensible that you can be both British and Irish. But obviously, yes. huge numbers of, of people in Scotland are, you know, have no problem considering, considering themselves both Scottish and British. And you even have you know, the whole idea of nationalist unionism or unionist nationalism. The Scots don't seem quite sure what to call the phenomenon. But this idea that you can be um, quite proud of being Scottish. You can almost you you analyse things like the British budget in terms of how much money is getting spent in Scotland, but you are still very much a unionist. That doesn't mean that you, you think that the connection should be broken. I wonder if what you think of kind of that parallel. Yes, yes. Well, it's a good point. I I, I know sometimes people don't quite understand this, but the, the example is one: uh, people in Scotland see themselves Scottish and British. Uh, Welsh, Welsh, and and British. Uh, the relative importance of these things can sometimes change. Uh, I mean, I, I carry a British passport, and it describes me. How do you think it describes me? It doesn't describe me as British. It describes me as a British citizen. My nationality is something different. Uh, my nationality I see as Irish. Some people call it Northern Irish. Uh, now, some people. Irish uh, citizenship and Irish identity uh, and nationality are one and the same, but there are varieties possible here. Uh, and I think we're more aware of this now, uh, especially within Britain, uh, where people simply saw themselves as British. Now they acknowledge more, acknowledge that, that Britain, the UK is a multinational state and people are British and also Welsh or English. Um, and that remains the case here in Northern Ireland. Uh, so many people did retain this sort of dual identity. But I think today we're more aware of these varieties and acknowledge people have these rights to look at things in this varied way. Thanks, Ida. Do you, do, what do you reckon? Oh, I'd love to come in there. And, you know, it is this, the, 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 I often describe um, the 1910s as a period when loyalties are in transition, um, but they're also extremely complex. So you see something like my gran aunt's down in, in Wexford, one of whom loses, loses her, her um, sorry, the dog's about to bark. Um, her boyfriend is, 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 is her fiance is killed in, in 1917 away at the war. But like in 1912, she's fundraising uh, for the United Irish Women. In 1916, she's fundraising for the Red Cross, which is seen as a British uh, organization. Again, apologies for the dog coming in there. And I came across a rather interesting little vignette when I was doing some work on uh, 1914 and about the Ireland's entry into the war. And at the same time, you see the rush to the volunteers. And Robert Barton's brother Erskine is at that stage, uh, the boys know this story already, um, is, is at that stage um, uh, a magistrate in Arthurstown in, in South Wexford, uh, appointed by Lord Cortown and a loyalist. And um, he starts, and I think the only word for it is stirring, and he goes up to um, the South Dublin branch of, of the Orange Order. And he says that Wexford Protestants in the, um, uh, run up to home rule and the volunteers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are um, feeling under threat that they can't express their loyalism and that they're afraid of being boycotted. And this causes a whole series of response in the Wexford newspapers, which is absolutely fascinating. And I'm always looking for clues of my own identity, my family identity. And, you know, my father would have been somebody who looked very deeply as a local historian at, at the identity of our family as well. And I saw um, one gentleman who was a family relation of ours, a guy called Willie Thorpe, who served at the New Ross Board of Guardians, and of course would have been a near neighbour of, um, of Erskine Barton. And he said, when will people stop denying me and my kind our nationalism? 
And I thought that was a really interesting thing to, to kind of throw into the mix. And then that in turn provoked a whole load of other local Protestants in Old Ross, which would of course been a key 1798 area, uh, to come in and say, look, you know, we've already always lived very peaceably hereabouts. And, you know, uh, we get on really well with our neighbours and we don't want anything to happen that could change that kind of equation at the moment. So this is talking about 1914. And they even say, you know, we've had no trouble. And, you know, why are they not thinking about 1798 then? Um, it, 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 again, it, all these ideas of who we are um, as a Church of Ireland community or communities, it's, I find uh, fascinating, you know, that we're once loyal, uh, say, to the British Army and to its engagement in the war, um, but at the same time loyal to um, certain movements that are going on within, you know, things like women's emancipation and the other aspects of the nationalist kind of, uh, bodies that are going on. So and having lived in Belfast for um, three or four years as well, I can see those kind of complexities there in Belfast's life today too, I think, Brian, that's fair to say, isn't it? And is, is there a sense to which um, maybe the, the people you're talking about both in the past and more recently is they feel different from they they're conscious of their own community and their own difference it's just that they feel more different they the their connection to say their neighbors is stronger than their connection to say anglicans in britain that be oh reason? absolutely uh yeah, i yeah. mean people would often say to us, oh, but you're British. You know, this is something I would have had quite a lot uh, growing up or that, you know, um, in, in the 60s and 70s, when you move outside your own community, people would say, oh, you know, but the Queen is the head of your church. And I'd have to say, well, actually, no, she's not. She's the head of the Church of England. And this is something that I think is familiar to, to you two as well, you know, that this is a, a common misconception, uh, you know, um, uh, that I think the head of the Church of Ireland is actually in the audience, but um, yes, um, that, 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 that is something that is simply not true. And that came up again with the Armagh um, commemoration recently too, where people would say, well, the Queen is the head of your church. And you'd have to say, no, well, actually, no. So there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, assumption that we, uh, have a look towards England, that we're interested in English politics, that we have a loyalty to the English crown. And I can tell you in Wexford, coming from families that were uh, Cromwellian, you don't typically see pictures of um, the British royal family, family up on the wall in Wexford the same way as you might have of John, John F. Kennedy or something like that, you know. Uh, but I do know that there would be equally um, uh, Church of Ireland families I know in Dublin that would have you know, always listen to the Queen's speech on, on um, Christmas Day or whatever, whatever day it's out. Is it Christmas Day or Boxing Day? I can't remember, as I don't listen. It's Christmas, Christmas Day. Day. I've had to <laughs> with the, my cousin's husband. You know, it's, 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 you know, we don't, certainly in the Southeast, we don't look towards Britain as being um, our homeland, I don't think. Mm. Okay. But they, they, uh, yeah, complex loyalties. I think that's that, that is actually the key. Um, uh, over my right shoulder, in fact, is the is the death plaque and medals won by Lieutenant Thomas Joseph Dalton, um, died in Etoffel in France in 1917. Um, but he wasn't a Protestant. He, he was he was th at that stage. The family had temporarily gone into Roman Catholicism, and a very devout version of it as well. Um, but that side of the family were, I suppose the derogatory term would be Catholic Catholics. But what they were actually were loyal Catholics, very, very loyal Catholics. They could have given uh, a, a lot of Protestant Unionists um, a, a fairly good lessons in loyalty. Um, I remember as a small child in my, uh, in, in this gentleman's uh, sister's house, my, my granddad uh, in Leeson Street, we were sat down on Christmas Day to listen to the Queen's Christmas speech. And yet the same lady, and I met him on several occasions, was, was a personal friend of John Charles McQuaid uh, and went to daily mass. So th there, th there is the idea that there is no particular conflict, but that actually applies the other way around as well. And um, 
Protestants in, in the South, now it, it, we don't do it as much now, but there, there was a constant questioning of our own sense of identity, which you don't find amongst the Catholic community by and large. Um, and I, I think to some extent it has made us very slightly sort of paranoid about what we are and who we are, because a lot of us tend to, tend to concentrate on this, whereas we, we shouldn't really, we should be able to live complex loyalties. Um, Nora Robertson, who wrote a book called Crowned Harp in 1960, writing about the 1920-30 period, said um, in, in a, something like this, in assuming new loyalties, it did not occur to us to throw our old ones overboard. And that meant that uh, particularly a sense of royalism, of connectivity with the British Empire and Commonwealth was seen as, was seen as compatible with citizenship, for instance, of the Irish Free State. Um, it, it wasn't necessarily in conflict with it. it. It could lie alongside it. And in the sense the partition in the North divided the communities, to some extent, partition in the South, slowly but gradually over time, actually brought them together. Thanks. And Brian, do you want to give maybe a, a kind of a two-sided Northern answer to that one kind of just to to wrap up what we've been talking about how northern anglicans saw themselves and maybe what their view what is of southern anglican of how southern anglicans see southern anglicans if, if you know what i mean so how their view of uh, southern anglicans identity northern jurisdiction um, in our prayer book, there'll be uh, a very uh, uh, for the Queen, for people in Northern Ireland. There'll also be one for the President in the Republic. Uh, this is the way we do things. We acknowledge this, and within the Church of Ireland, there's an acceptance that this is the way we do things, uh, and um, this doesn't cause any any problem. Um, it, it's important that the Church has remained a, as one unit. Uh, and within that unit, there are now a great variety of opinions and views. Uh, you, you know, the last uh, leader of the, the last first minister we had here, Arlene Foster, was a member of the Church of Ireland. Uh, we've had then leading Southern political figures, members of the Church of Ireland. Uh, these people have all worked within their own political entities and, and played an important role. Uh, and this is seen as perfectly reconcilable with being members of the Church of Ireland. Um, uh, the tensions that surfaced over politics in this period uh, were very severe um, and uh, caused difficulties for many people. Uh, for many Southern Protestants, this was a very tough period. Uh, large numbers left. Um, the number of pop Protestants in the Southern population goes down by a third. There's a debate over why this happens between 1911 and 1926, and uh, various economic and social factors are at play. Um, so are things like departure of people in the army who would have been listed in 1911 uh, as living in Ireland, being Protestant, they're no longer there, obviously. But there are also considerable numbers who leave because of violence and fear of violence. Uh, but by 19, after the Civil War is over, things begin to settle down. Um, the Protestants begin to feel more secure. Uh, and of course, the important thing is that the majority of Protestants do remain and continue to contribute uh, to Ireland, which they see as their country, uh, and are happy to do so. Now, in Northern Ireland's different, except that that, obviously. Yeah, except that that participation actually, there's an initial participation. There's there's ele there's some, something, to at least a dozen uh, TDs in the Dáil in 1923 are Protestant, but by 1977 there's actually only one. Yes. Now, um, you know, yes. the, the the religious composition, the, the the idea of religion as setting your identity uh, politically, socially, economically, has largely vanished now in the 21st century. But but then it was. So the, the, I I would entirely agree with with Brian uh, about about the about the idea that the um, that, that, that Southern Anglicans were under pressure um, after 1921. Um, there was all, we can argue till the cows come home about why Protestants left um, in such numbers. But the point is that, that, that the, the position continued. So 
you know, the, the, the decline in the Protestant, the Southern Protestant population continues well, well into the, right up to the end of the, um, of the 20th century, in effect. Um, so you're going from 10% of, of the population uh, of what became 26 counties in 1911 to around about 3.5% in 1991. So it's declining, it's declining all, all the time. Nowadays, the situation is entirely different. I mean, there's more Muslims and Methodists in, 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 in the Republic of Ireland. Um, uh, so, so, so times have changed in that regard. But I think the, the, the Protestant sense of identity is also a sense of a declining minority. Um, and that, is, that starts quite early. The, the consciousness of being a minority is, is, the, is, is what partition exposes. Um, just as in the, the countervailing thing in the North is that there's a Catholic minority. But you have other factors coming in, for instance, the, the attrition of the tribes through the application of mixed marriage rules by, by the Catholic Church and so forth. And that, that, is, that is wearing away, it's grinding the tribe down slowly. There's economic emigration in the 30s and 40s, which is no different to the emigration of, of Catholics during the period in effect. Um, but there, there are the, these these sort of things that are actually happening, which are, um, which give the minority that sense of its of its own vulnerability, if you like, over the period. But but that is but that's what partition to some extent. It doesn't necessarily ignite it because it, it was it was always there, but it cert it certainly makes it more relevant in how the church organizes itself. It, it goes through a constant uh, process of, of reorganization, financial and and um, and, a par and 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 organizational uh, from from the 1920s. Uh, uh, one of the main things was that it recognized bef before partition that. Uh, the, its resources were not matched to its its people on the its financial resources to its people on the ground. So it, it it was already undergoing that that process of change. The Church of Ireland was uh, before partition, but partition exacerbated it. Certainly in terms of the south, you had growing parishes in the north. Um, you know, a par one parish in Belfast could have as many um, uh, Anglicans in it. As the uh, as the entire province of Connaught, for instance, so it, you have that sort of imbalance which has to be addressed by the church, and and it does so. I mean, it stops start, it's it's slow going, but it, it it generally manages to keep itself afloat during that during that post partition period. You raise um, Nitemri there, Ian, and I th think it's very interesting when you look and see that actually it takes a while for the, the, the kind of uh, demographic effects of Nitemri to filter through. And when you're looking, uh, you know, thanks to the census material, et cetera, online that we can look at, we can see, you know, the religion and that the, 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 there were quite a few um, what we call mixed marriages. I say all marriages are mixed because they're generally between a man and a woman, or at least were until recently. Um, uh, but um, that, that quite a lot of the revolutionaries had a mixed religious background within their families. And that then gradually you see politicians becoming more and more, um, uh, you know, the effects of Nitemri are coming in more and more uh, as you go through the 20th century, that, that, that you don't get that kind of mixed background uh, as much. And I wonder how much of an influence that is on um, changing, apologies for the dog bark barking, the kind of... Um, influence of protestants on the state and on politics just to throw that in there and another question if you, tom if you don't mind me taking the chair for a second um would be to look at both of you and i'd say it's fair or would you think it's fair uh, i should ask this as a question so i don't run into trouble um to say um that the sources both of you look in a way are the, at the sources of elites whereas i'm a historian from below and I tend to look at, you know, whether it's looking at disease and tenements or Protestants playing GA, as I, I look at, 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 at uh, history from below and history of people who are not covered by the records. So do you think, how do you think that colours your own view of um, the kind of history we're telling? Or am I wrong to even suggest that in the first place? Please attack me if you feel free to. Uh, Brian? <laughs> 
Well, I, I suppose it, it may colour my view to some extent, uh, but at the same time, one has to look at the general picture and, and the facts and figures are there one can't get away with. I mean, the Protestant population does decline. Uh, between 1926 uh, and 1971, it falls by 40% in the 26 counties. And this is the reality. There's no, no getting away from that. And it is interesting how in, in the first decade, actually, uh, there was considerable participation uh, in spite of their small numbers. Uh, Ian has drawn attention to that, the numbers in the 1920s, but that does decline. And things actually, uh, from that point of view, get worse by the 1970s and 80s, we're down to one Protestant TD uh, in the Doyle. But things changed then, of course, in the 1990s. I think this follows the election of Mary Robinson. Uh, there's a new liberalism, there's a new ecumenism. Uh, things like Nathan Mary are regarded as very bad altogether. Um, important figures from the Catholic Church speak out against them and there are great changes and we know that from 90, from, from 1991 until 2011 there is a growth in the number of Protestants in the South and this reflects this new society uh, there's a growth in the number of Southern politicians from a Protestant background um, so this is all science of an improvement um, but the hundred, last hundred years have been a time of great change um, and uh, we're now in a new year altogether. Uh, but it's uh, important that we look back at these and with some empathy and understanding. Uh, uh, initially, initially uh, when the history of the Church of Ireland was written in 1932, uh, this uh, period was really ignored uh, and Protestants preferred not to talk about it. But now people do, um, people acknowledge what happened. Uh, and this reflects a, a tolerant, uh, pluralist society that we live in today uh, and allows us to be free to talk about these things uh, and to acknowledge the bad times, but also acknowledge uh, how people stood against these activities. Uh, I can think of examples where uh, Catholic bishops spoke out against some of the things that were happening to Protestants in, the, in 1922. Uh, political leaders did as well. Uh, they did go on, but there were important people prepared to stand up and, and, and say this was wrong. Uh, and I think we have to acknowledge both these aspects. Thanks. Um, I, 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 before I, I Ian comes in there, the just point. on, on elite sources yep. and, and how, how people view, mm. I just wonder as well, Ian, if you might tell us anything you know about, in the course of your answer, tell us anything you know about the de destination country in terms of the uh, population decline. So I'm, I'm assuming the whole popula the whole decline of population that we see in in the church of ireland is I mean, i'm assuming that that's not all down to nate temere I'm, ass, I'm assuming there's a degree of emigration yeah. in there and do we oh, do yeah. we know do yeah. anglicans have a greater tendency to emigrate to britain or do many simply cross the border and you know any dynamics like that as, as just our I, I probably I'd probably let Brian answer that really, but, but as far as I know, broadly speaking, uh, Britain or the what you might call loosely the White Commonwealth or Empire would have been the destination yeah. countries, not necessarily the United States. Even even though as Brian well as Brian well knows, there are more Irish Americans of of Protestant descent in in the United States than there are of of Catholic. Catholic ones, but can I can I answer um, or try to answer uh, Ida's point about elite history? Um, it, it depends, of course. It, 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 it all depends on how you define an elite. Um, but uh, yes, I, I, the, the problem the problem with elite history is generally the elites are people who write things down uh, and who and who have who have who have recorded lives. So. You know, it, 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 the non-elites don't have that luxury. The nearest we can get are some of the oral histories that have been done in this particular area over the last while. Um, Heather Crawford's book, Outside the Glow, for instance, is, is, a, is one. And more, more recently, um, Deirdre Nuttall's um, folklore-based uh, history of looking at Protestants uh, called Different and the Same. Uh, and there you do definitely get a sense amongst ordinary protestants of alienation um it, it's some of it some of it is it is seems to be quite intense others it's, it's sort of wispy it, it comes it goes but but there is no doubt that there was an undercurrent of 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 people who um 
who may have felt marginalized in 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 the in the free state um Deirdre's book uh, relied on people contacting her about it. So there might be some sort of confirmation bias there in terms of, of how people actually felt. Um, I think that for most Protestants, um, pr Protestantism was prosperous relative to the general population. Um, you know, in, in, in under the, if you look at the 1926 figures, you, you see that they have somewhere between, still between uh, 20 and 40% of, the people participating in the higher, uh, so-called higher occupations, things like barristers, doctors, dentists, even artists, for instance, um, and that 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 is that that is significant. So they're controlling the the the, the, the levers of power. Uh, they still have a, a disproportionate ownership of large farms, uh, and not just only in places like the border counties, but throughout the throughout the southern uh, part of the island. So this is a prosperous people. And as a prosperous people, they have to, the same thing to do is to go with the flow and defend your interests as best you see that. And that would certainly not have been um, advanced by sticking your head up over the parapet and, sh and, and screaming blue murder. Um, it, th that way could have led to dispossession and, and expulsion. Um, and Irish Protestants, uh, you know, suffered the hardships they suffered during the revolutionary period were nothing like you saw that were visited upon similar types of minorities in in eastern europe particularly after the after the first world war um it be uh, it will hardly register on a blip as a revolution um in, in those terms but the elites the elites even more so were able to carry on living life more or less as they did it didn't bother them too much uh, they still had their money, they still had their houses, uh, and that worked. For the people further down the, the, the economic um, line, things might have been a little bit different. But finding but that out was particularly yes. difficult. Yes. But nevertheless, uh, 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 those people did exist. And that oh, yeah. was my issue, course, is yeah. that, uh, and why I reversed again, as I say, into Protestant history, uh, which I ran from, you know, because I was a, a child, I suppose, growing up in the 70s, when the last thing you wanted to do was to be um, seen as the other in any way. You were trying to fit in rather than not fit in. And I mean, 70s, the 70s and the Troubles certainly caused issues for southern protestants uh, and uh, that we definitely went down and into ourselves and um became very quiet and uh tried not to show our opinions and um retreated i suppose a lot for a, a lot into our uh family communities and parish communities and local communities where we would mingle with, with you know everybody in the community i'm not saying just within our own religious confines but um the, the 70s made a difference they definitely made a difference to our existence and to the way we saw ourselves. And I remember, you know, sitting with my father down in Wexford in the 70s when I was actually a journalism student. And you'd be shouting at the television as RTE would say a Protestant or a, a Catholic was killed. And I'm saying, no, it's not a, a religious difference. It is a political difference. And, you know, because we felt that that then mirrored and transferred onto us in the South as well and made life more tense for us as well as for the terrible positions that were people were experiencing in the North. Um, I'm forgetting now where I started off with that point. But I'll let you okay. go. Brian, you can come in there. And, yes, uh, I, 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 I'll just come in on, on the question of elites. Uh, I just made a very good point. Uh, and uh, as Ian has said, there were, uh, you know, the top professions had a high proportion of Protestants among them. But there are many, let's call them ordinary Protestants, especially in the border counties from, Anna, you know, Monaghan, uh, Cavan and Donegal. And in other parts of Ireland, that was also the case. And when we talk about the decline of Protestant numbers in this period, it's not just members of the big house who are leaving and who find difficulty. It's shopkeepers, small farmers and labourers in the Protestant community. And there are many of such people. Uh, so, so we do have to remember that. Uh, but I can just say that, uh, you know, this is a, a time of great change this century. We've gone through all these differences. Uh, and the hope is that when we come out of that, uh, we can now, as I say, look at this period with empathy and acknowledge that uh, bad things were in many ways. But on the other hand, uh, and these things didn't go away uh, after the first 50 years, as Ida said, 
uh, many people felt marginalized in the 70s and 80s uh, but today we live in a different world uh, there's a plural an idea of pluralism acceptance of differences uh, and uh, I think the Protestant community uh, has now a brighter future than it did say 30 or 40 years ago uh, so that's just the new world we live in now whether or not it will be yeah. hold up in the world of secularism that we're coming into uh, I, I hope it can uh, mm. but that's a different challenge thanks Brian and there my dad is, has um, shared a memory here of the time he upset the editors of the journal studies by comparing Anglicanism or Anglo-Catholicism to Roman Catholicism um, he notes he, uh, the Jesuit editors of studies weren't too impressed with his suggestion. Um, I really hope you weren't doing this while I was at a Jesuit school, but that's a, that's another day's work. Um, Ian, do you have any thoughts on, on those parallels and maybe Irish Catholic reluctance to acknowledge um, differences within Protestantism? Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that, that's not insignificant. Um, I mean, the, 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 the diff, there's a different dynamic in the South in, in regard to the, the wider Protestant community, by which I would include Presbyterians, Methodists, Anglicans. Um, you, you can start doing add-ons at that point, but you're talking about very small numbers after that. But the, the, uh, because the Anglicans in the South were by far the dominant denomination, they consisted of around about 80, over 80 percent, and probably still do um in the north the situation is is much different where you have presbyterian and in its presbyterianism in it, in its various manifestations much much more more, more powerful um and, and in the north too although i'm not going to strain to brian's territory but in the north you have a you have um, an anglican elite which is essentially leading a, a mixed anglican protestant um movement if you like in unionism and and that causes tensions as well uh, 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 of its kind but down south the dynamic is is quite different so um protestant and anglican down south are practically for all practical purposes are are, are synonymous um and uh there there would there was a sense in the south of protestants no matter what their denomination of effectively all being on the same side as it were um I think the situation is much more complex in in the north in that regard. Uh, Brian, do you have anything to add? I mean, I think there's also an interesting dynamic just that I know from some studies that the there are see, there, one of the declines in population in 1921 and 22 is is a complete collapse in the number of people answering Church of England in the census because obviously civil servants, members of the army, and the staff of big houses all, all depart. So and any thoughts just on, on differences within Protestantism in general, Brian? And, and... Well, I, I suppose some of the uh, military coming from England will regard themselves as the Church of England, but I don't think many residential uh, or civil uh, Protestants who were Church of Ireland would have called themselves Church of England. Uh, I mean, if you go back 70 years ago before this establishment, that would have been the case, but it's not the case anymore. Uh, and I think the, the, the vast majority would simply call themselves Church of Ireland. In fact, nearly, nearly all call themselves Church of Ireland. Uh, and that title re remains the case. Um, now, in Northern Ireland, uh, Ian is quite right to point out that the Church of Ireland is not the largest denomination. It is the Presbyterian Church, which is the largest denomination. I suppose in the past there were rivalries between those two churches, uh, but by the 20th century, that's really no longer the case. Um, and these two churches are, are, are the main voices of, of Protestant opinion in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, today, I suppose it's different. Um, we have still these two churches. We have other churches as well, of course. Uh, Methodists are very important, I should have mentioned. Um, but then we have others uh, such as Free Presbyterians, Ian Paisley's church. We have other evangelical groups. Uh, so it's quite a, a, a varied group we have now. Uh, there are, I suppose, some tensions between North and South. I think the Northern Church tends to be more evangelical, more conservative. Uh, Southern Church less evangelical, more high church perhaps, uh, and uh, more liberal. Uh, but so far we've avoided any severe splits in the church over any such issue. 
I mean, I think we glossed over your point earlier about the the early decline in numbers. I just wonder, just in both in terms of the decline of numbers and psychological effects, what was both the reaction of the church and reaction and the reaction of the church's members to the violence in the we we'll take the violence in in three different lots the um sectarian civil war i'm going to use the divisions i think are useful the sectarian civil war in the north the um anglo-irish conflict in the 26 counties and along the border and the civil war in the in the 26 counties so i mean do you want to under those three headings what were the reactions of the church to that violence and what do you think the long time long-term psychological impact was well, in the north, there were efforts by clergy uh, to oppose the sectarian violence that happened in Lisbon, for example, after there were attacks on, on Catholic families following uh, the murder of Inspector Swansea. And then in Belfast, we have the case of the Reverend John Redmond, vicar of Ballymacarrot, going out in the streets to stop violence. Uh, and we have other examples of church leaders in 1922 coming together, uh, but they don't really have an awful lot of influence on this violence uh, if we then go to the south uh, it seems that i mean the war of independence was a tough time for the protestant community um, and members did suffer but it, curiously the worst time seems to be after that uh, from january 1922 throughout 1922 after the rest of the civil war it, it's very strange in some ways you might have expected in the war in the war of independence that had been seen as loyalists and therefore this, they would have suffered because of that. But it does seem that the worst period uh, was in the 1922-23 period. Uh, now, church leaders uh, do denounce this violence. Um, and if we look at the Church of Ireland diocesan uh, uh, speeches by bishops, Church of Ireland bishops, they speak against this. I also have to say, uh, with examples of, of Catholic bishops also, uh, speaking against this violence, as the Bishop of Kill, who uh, did uh, in 1922, um, acknowledging that the period of the Civil War had been a very violent time for many members of the Protestant community, but absolutely denouncing this and saying it was a denial of patriotism and Christianity and taking a strong stand against it. So the churches um, are faced with this violence. Um, we do see efforts to try and, and ameliorate it. Uh, of course, they at the same time, they identify with their own people. Um, uh, Church of Ireland clergy would have identified very much with the Unionist population in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, Catholic Church, likewise, with their own community. So that was a difficulty. Uh, but nonetheless, we do see efforts to try and stop this violence. Yeah. I, I I, I, or sorry, Ian, come on in. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree entirely. I think the, the interesting thing is the is the violence against uh, Protestant prominent Protestants during the during the Civil War period. I, I suppose you might explain that by saying that there, there were a number of, of, of Protestants who took a relatively high profile um, uh, part in setting up the state, if you like. Uh, I'm thinking of the, the Protestant senators, for instance, in the First Irish Senate. So. Um, you have you have a number of senators' houses, Protestant senators' houses. Um, you have Catholic ones as well, of course. But Protestant senators' houses targeted. So you have Lord Mayo's Palmerstown House in, in Kildare, and you have you have um, Horace Plunkett's in in Fox Rock destroyed by fire. And I suppose the reason might have been that the that the anti-treatyites, uh, as it were, saw a double, a, a, you know, that, that these were double traitors, if you like. They were members of the old, as it were, um, dominant ascendancy class, but they had supported enthusiastically, if you like, and, and, and given their nihil obstat and imprimatur to the new regime. And, and as such, they, they were sort of seen possibly as, as doubly culpable in, in that regard, and were therefore probably disproportionately um, targeted. Pour en courage les autres, if nothing else, I suspect, at the end of the day. I mean, that's a question I have listening to some of your, your I've listened, listening to some of your other lectures, Ian. I, I wonder, do did the Civil War hasten the integration of some protestants particularly elite protestants into the new state because the cleavage becomes between those who accept the treaty 
and those who don't. And most Protestants do accept the treaty. So that so that removes the previous cleavage that there had been between nationalists and unionists in the south and in Dublin, and um, separatists and home rulers, if you want to use it. Another term now. I know most home rulers are, are look supporting Dominion Dominion Home Rule by by 1922. So that line gets blurred as well. But I wonder, just on the point of Protestants, does that does the does that change in the in delineation that the big conflict is between those who support the treaty and those who don't? Does that help integrate Protestants into the system? I'll give you one example that I'm familiar with, which is that the Dockrell family make their peace mm. with nationalism to a degree and join with Cumann and Oyle long before the Redmondites do. Yeah, I mean you've people like um you've people like Brian Cooper who becomes a, a, a common L T D um having been a unionist one originally. I, I think broadly speaking uh, uh, what the Common Nagale government, the anti treaty the, the pro treaty side was giving was stability and order. If you read the um, the Church of Ireland Gazette around the time of uh, of partition, uh, followed by the, the the truce and the treaty, the, the the dominant thing there is we want to see stability and order. Uh, back in the country again. So it was a question of who could supply that stability and order the best. And in this case, it was clearly it was clearly the new the, the Irish Free State government. And to that extent, I suppose people were the Protestants were were operating in their own best interests, if you like. I'm not sure that they didn't do it so much by still by holding their noses a little bit. Um, but 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 it it, it was worth. It was worth the the odd whiff, the odd odor passing under the nostrils in order to make sure that you had proper police, proper courts, proper enforcement of rules, regulations, uh, a, a conservative fiscal policy. One of the things I think that we underestimate is the conservatism of our Southern Irish Protestantism in this period. And it was quite happy with much of the things that the, the first, uh, that the, the Fine Gael government did. And indeed, even, even the De Valera government after 1932. I mean, Protestants were not raging radicals who wanted to, um, who wanted to introduce abortion and, and, and get their servants, allow their servants to read licentious literature uh, or see dodgy films, quite the opposite. So you had a very, con very conservative um, uh, population there, which went, which was quite happy for many, for many, many years to go along with the, with, with the free state. Um, at the, you know, the, the much further on, the Church of Ireland Gazette con is, con is as condemnatory of, the mo of Noel Brown's mother and child scheme as the Catholic hierarchy was, um, the, because this was interference in the family for the same reason. And so therefore, it's, it's a conservative country. So our Ireland becomes conservative, landed and devout again, except in this case, it's not, it's not a Protestant conservatism or a landlord led landed society, but or, or otherwise it's, it's a Catholic one. But essentially the, the, the nature of society uh, sits and fits neatly with 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 much of a Protestant mindset at that period, and we wouldn't want to be seduced by the by the high profile radicals like Hubert Butler and so these people were so far ahead of their of their own army that they were that they were in danger of being marooned badly in no man's land and frequently more actually scouts, were. more scouts than leaders maybe to continue the army analogy. Yeah. Um, Ida, do you have any comment there? Uh, what was it Ian was Hubert Butler's phrase that he just said that the, the southern the typical Southern Irish Protestant finds it very hard to congeal into a group to form a single block of opinion, and I, I found that fascinating, particularly in the context of the seventies. You know that that our opinions were often taken, eluded therefore with the kind of uh, unionist northern uh, sector, um, and, and uh, but, but but Butler. That the fact that you raise Butler also brings us to another point that I think is really important is that that a lot of Protestants just weren't educated, and um, again maybe you know the communities that I would come from wouldn't have had you know until the seventies uh, a secondary education. My mother had it because she won a scholarship. She did a scholarship to mm -hmm. the Collegiate School in Selbridge, and again she had a scholarship. She won a county council scholarship uh, to UCD 
which was quite radical, you know, for a Protestant to do in those days. Uh, she was, I think, the first woman and the first Protestant to get it from Wexford. Uh, but she got it, which I think is really fascinating uh, because she was from a place called the Lep in um, uh, South Wexford between Enniscorthy and Clonroach. And the local Catholic schoolmaster put it in her in for it because he knew that her family wouldn't let her apply and that she was awfully bright. So, you know, that was a typical example of the kind of community kindness that takes place within our uh, Wexford community um, and, you know, continually uh, shows how different I think we are to many other parts of the country. Another thing, when Brian, when you were talking there about the, the, the migration, is that in Wexford we experienced Protestant migration from Cork, from West Cork. Uh, not much, but, you know, maybe 20 or 30 people we could point to within our community who did move in, in, in when things got difficult in West Cork. And um, I was trying to think of this, uh, yeah, a pal of mine, Michael Dyer, has done an MA study on um, who left Wexford in terms of, but particularly looking around Gorey, very odd community in Gorey because it's quite Methodist and quite Presbyterian. So quite different to that typical Anglican profile. But he went back through, um, you know, uh, things like baptismal records, census records, etc., and found that most of the people who left that region, the kind of Gory region, were either English born or declared as Church of England for those of them who were Anglican. You know, so that, that, that but that's only a microcosm of a local community. And the only person yeah, I mean, I should say that that was part of my reference to the Church of England earlier is a lot of yeah. those people who, who I referenced were often servants in the big house who were, were hired yeah. for various yeah. things. Mm. Uh, of one question, final question. So I don't let you finish yeah. up what you were saying and then maybe you could address this mm. and we pass it on to the two lads to, to round up very quickly before we finish up which is the effect of, in, in recent years, with the Celtic Tiger and everything else, the effect of inward migration of Anglicans from um, all points on, mm -hmm. on uh, the identity within the Church of Ireland. So if you want to finish your point and then move on to that, and then we let Ian come in after when you're done. Yeah, I was just going to say the only person in my own family who left in that period was my great, great grandmother, who was a Dundas. And I've only recently found out that her first cousin was married to Austin Chamberlain, which certainly makes for very complicated family history. But she was she was Yorkshire born. Um, I think one of the best things about the very uh, pluralist or uh, the, the, the change country we've become, the New Ireland, is that Protestants no longer stick out. We are now perhaps seen as as more normal mm. than we were yeah. before. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. OK. Um, sorry, your question was about changes in the Church of Ireland, isn't it? Yeah, with, with immigration with, with, and, and with immigration, you know, yeah. from everywhere, from that, Nigeria, that, that, Australia, Britain, anywhere. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's quite interesting. The Church is the, certainly, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see the Archbishop has left us so I can, I can make more mistakes about the Church of Ireland without him tapping me on the shoulder. Um, the, um, the, uh, uh, to, to some extent, the Church of Ireland it, it has had to struggle with um, a, quite a large wave of of of, of immigrant Anglicans, and mainly a, a lot of them from 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 the African subcontinent. Now that that is a that is a tricky one because they bring with them certain traditions and styles styles of worship not to mention theological beliefs, which sometimes sit rather uneasily with the rather fuddy-duddy old-fashioned way of doing things because they've always been done that way. Um, one of the advantages, I'm thinking of my own particular parish uh, uh, in Kildare, um, we're blessed or cursed, depending how you want to classify it, uh, as one cleric doing three churches, three physical churches. But that actually allows, to some extent, a division out. So one of the churches is, um, shall we say, more modern in its worship because of the nature of its congregation. Um, uh, the other two tend to be rather conservative, um, a much more elderly congregation, for instance. Uh, the, the, the divide uh, in, in my particular area, and I can only speak of it, tends to be on um, uh, on age grounds rather than anything else. 
but there is a rather disturbing feeling that there is an in, what you might call it the indigenous church of ireland is rapidly dying out um i it, it's hard to see in many some quite a few churches people under the age of 50. um and you know the pessimists will say uh, it, it's going to vanish the optimists say that the influx of people uh, enthusiastic anglicans are going are going to revive it so the church of ireland if it still exists in 25 years is going to be a very different sort of church of ireland there's no doubt about that uh, whether it's going to be better or worse i don't know but what i do know is certainly in the south it's going to be very different it may you could argue of course that that would make it more of ireland of its time but anyway just to yes. deal with that, these last issues to wrap us up um what answer from the north brian the uh, contribution that people from the African continent have made to the Church of Ireland in the South. I was recently in Waterford Cathedral and I was impressed by the number of people there uh, from Africa. I was also impressed by an event connected to this period we've been talking about 1921. There was a ceremony, an inter-church ceremony in County Longford to remember all those who died in a, an IRA ambush in 1921. Uh, the local rector took part and he was a, of an African background, took part in the service to remember all who died and it was a remarkable interchurch service uh, on that occasion. So uh, I would be optimistic. Uh, I think the, uh, let's call them the, uh, I hesitate to call them the native population, but uh, those uh, of an original Irish background uh, still playing a very important role in the Church of Ireland. I'd be more optimistic about their survival and their continued role in the church than Ian would be. Uh, but I think it's very healthy that there's now this contribution from people from other parts of the world, uh, all contributing to a, a much more lively church than we would have seen in the past. So uh, I ended an optimistic well, note. Thank you very much for that, Brian. And uh, it was really great that you could join us. That Ian could join us, that Ida could join us, that Ida's dog could join us, that the Archbishop could join us, and it was, uh, I think it was a good discussion for everybody. So, so thanks everybody for coming along. We will be back within the hour um, on Crowdcast for the next uh, instalment of Border One Hundred, which will, which Dexter Govan from Edinburgh University will give us a talk on the Orange Order and partition, understanding the Orange Order and partition. And Dexter recently contributed an article to the Irish Studies Review on towards a religious understanding of the Orange Order. So, so that may have some similar themes to this talk. And of course, the recording will be available as soon, soon after we finish. So thank you very much. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you.